Good morning. morning. How's everyone doing today? Is that a good time of worship? Amen. Amen. God is good. I tell you, guys, like uh, Rachel was saying and Mariah, such good words that just the key is surrender, you know? Uh, It's, I always believe this, that, you know, it says that, that God, you know, God gave his all for us and now in love he asks us to give our all to him. Amen. Not to, amen, that was, hello? And, uh, but is that we, we do it out of love, amen? We don't do it because we've got to. We do it because we want to, amen? And there's such a blessing in surrender, you know? There's such a blessing in brokenness, and we need to have that before God and, and have that dependence on Him. If you're a Bible, please turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, verse 15. And as we've been studying, you know, Daniel is one of the most prophetic books there are. It's an amazing book, and uh, we've been learning a lot, and now we've moved, the first six chapters were kind of Daniel's history, but now we're moving to prophetically, and uh, how many know it's good to know what's going to happen in the last days, because we're in the last days, and so it's good to know what uh, coming attractions, because uh, how many can admit it's a little scary out there? Okay, so if you don't know what's going to happen, you're going to be swept away like the world. You know, how many know there's going to be great fear in the last days? And how many know that it says, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in all the world? How how many like to have faith when the Lord comes? Amen. And so we need to know his word because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so that's how we get faith. You don't just wish for faith. You can pray for faith, but you also get it through the study of God's word. And that's why we study the word of God verse by verse. I heard, a, oh, and the title of today's message is Four Beasts, Four Great Beasts, Part Two. Last one, yes, last week was Part One. I heard a cartoon uh, this week, it was pretty cool. It said, there was a little man sitting at his home office, and he called the editor of the newspaper and said, Mr. Editor, I just want to let you know that I didn't receive my paper today. And the editor said, oh, I'm sorry about that. Would you like us to send you out a new one, or a one to run right now? And he said, No. I just wanted to thank you. <laughs> How many could say amen to that? <laughs> you know, the paper, I, I could only, li- only read so much, and I could only listen to so much news, even good news. I mean, even like people that are, you know, conservative news people, because uh, I get worked up. Does anyone else get worked up by the news? Anyone else out there? Two people? You guys are liars. But anyways, I get worked up and I get frustrated. But how many know when you know what's happening, as we're going to see today, then you can have peace to know that God is in control. How many know God is not biting his nails? You know, he's not freaking out. He's not like what we're tempted to do. But hear this, I, I, as I said last week, I love how um, we were saying this, how God is light. And that means God travels at the speed. He's light. So there is no, they say Einstein, his theory was if you travel at the speed of light, there is no time. Amen? That time is now. So that, that means God is looking at Adam and Eve right now. And he's looking at the end of our life right now. And so there isn't like, you remember Adam and Eve? It's, so he's, how many know, he's already seen your life lived. So he's not going, oh, he's going, I know. That's why he can say things like this, before Esau was ever born, I didn't like him. You know? And you go, how could he do that? Because he saw his life before it was ever lived out. Amen. God sees everything. And when the point I want to make, I don't know if I'm making a point, but the point I'm trying to make is that you can have peace that God has already seen the plan for your life to be victorious in him. Amen? So rest in that when you see that, when you see crazy times. Or, and I heard a pastor say this week that one of the greatest works of the devil is fear. Amen? You know, some of you know my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer in, in January, February, or January, and we were kind of freaked out by it. But how do we know that God is still a healer? But, but the thing, what, what the enemy tries to tempt you is with fear, right? Cancer, he could come back. But how do we know we have to know God is good and he's faithful? And, and like Paul said, I love this. I love, I love to say things that really frustrate the devil. But here's what, the, here's what Paul said. To live is Christ, to die is gain. How many know if you're in Christ, you cannot lose? Because if you're going to live, you're going to live for Christ. And if you die, if God allows you to go home, then it's good too. And I always say, you know, the Chuck Smith thing where he says that it's funny how we talk about how good heaven is, but we sure try hard to stay out of it. You know, how many know we shouldn't try to do crazy things, but how many know if it's our time, we should be excited. We get to go home. It's a homecoming, not he died. 
you know. He got to go home. He graduated. That's cool. Amen. The final six chapters, I said, of Daniel are not autobiographical history of Daniel anymore, but they're incredible prophecy. And that's what we're going to look at today. For they deal with future events. And with Daniel, in Daniel's day, they were future. But how many know in our day, from our perspective, that a lot of them already come to pass? And they will come to pass very soon. And just kind of a recap of what we saw last week is we saw four great beasts. Four great beasts. And here it is. The first beast was Babylon. It was a lion with great eagle's wings that had been, we said, were clipped off. And that was when Nebuchadnezzar, remember, he fell. He got prideful. He said, look what I've done. God humbled him. He became a beast. His wings were clipped off. But then he was restored to his kingdom. He became a believer in God. And then he was restored. And then we saw the second one. The beast was a bear, spoke of the Medo-Persian Empire, the Medes and the Persians combined an empire, and that's why you have the chest of silver uh, and two arms, two, two uh, governments becoming one. Uh, they were the Medo-Persian Empire was the bear, and they, just, they had a 2.5 million man army and just conquered, crushed people. Then we saw the leopard, which speaks of the Greeks, and remember Alexander the Great, he defeated an army, the Medes and the Persians, of 2.5 million men with 35,000 men. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And he was just swooped in, and that's why he was Alexander the Great. And he just swooped in and took him. He's a leopard. He pounced on them quickly. And then, uh, which he is synonymous with the belly of brass in chapter 2. The fourth and last beast is the Roman Empire. And that speaks of the legs of iron in chapter 2. And out of it, we saw then there was the ten toes, which were iron and clay mixture, and we're going to see that today. Out of it, we see the ten horns, synonymous. And I know some of this is pretty trippy. I mean, if you're a new believer and you're a new Christian, what? I mean, it's, it's a little wild. I'll never forget. Does anyone, how many old timers remember the, the movie, uh, what was it, the, uh, what was the last day's movie? What was it? The Thief in the Night. Does anyone remember that movie? And seeing guillotines, whing, and you're like, Whoa! I remember I was weak, old in the Lord. I went, I think I've joined a cult. I mean, I was freaked out. It was like scary. But now we know that stuff is really going to happen. And, and I used to think, how could people's heads get chopped off? How many know we can believe it today, can't we? There's somebody who likes to chop heads off, right? And so we believe, whoa. And you think, that's so barbaric. We've evolved from that. We're not like that anymore. We're, we're a sophisticated society or world. Baloney, right? So we see that, and God is speaking that. But today we're going to see that uh, this, is, this is the old, uh, this is the ten toes and the uh, mixed with clay, the Roman Empire, and these ten toes speaks the confederation of a ten nation coming out of the old Roman Empire. And this will be, um, some people say this is going to be the uh, European Union. And it's wild though, you know, how many know this European Union now has 28 nations in it? So, hmm, you know, but how many know maybe, maybe, they used to have 10 when Chuck Smith, Smith wrote this, it was 10, so it worked good. So we got to go backwards in time. No, but how many know maybe some of these will kick out or maybe they'll be defeated? I don't know. But in the last days, there will be a 10 nation kind of a revived Roman Empire of ten nations, and they will, from which the Antichrist will come out of. That will be what we saw last week, the little horn, and we'll talk about that more. Let's pray so that this makes sense to us. Amen. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the sweet time of worship, just the peace of your presence and the joy of your salvation. Lord, I ask that as the word was given today, that the prophetic word of surrender, May we surrender our hearts to you. May we trust you as that, that song, Risk the Ocean, that we'll realize that, Lord, diving into your arms can be a little scary at first, but once we do it, we know we're going to be grabbed up by our loving Father, and you're going to take care of us, and you're going you're gonna to just guard us and protect us and love us. Like I look at my little daughter, my little Trinity, and I just grab her and kiss her face. Lord, thank you that you love us more than that. And you love each one of us. And so, Father, may we trust our good and heavenly Father. May we surrender to you. And I pray that you would speak to us today. Speak to everyone in this room. And I pray that you would anoint my tongue and my mind. That everything I say would be of you. And that, Lord, I would even say things that aren't even in my notes. That, that would speak to your people. That they would say, surely God is in your midst. That they would not glorify a person, but they would glorify you. And they would say, man... God is so good. God is here. So, Father, have your way. Just like you've moved in the worship, we ask now that you would move powerfully in the teaching. 
Thank you that your word is blessed. We don't have to pray a blessing on your word. It's blessed. But Lord, let me be anointed to speak your truth clearly and accurately. And I pray for every ear that's out here, whether it be in, the, in here or out in the lobby or on internet, that Father God, that they would hear you, that there'd be no distractions. They'd be bound from distraction and your Holy Spirit would just speak. And everyone agreed with this prayer said, Amen. 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 I like loud amens, because what does amen mean? So be it. So I know you're not agreeing, you're not saying so be Craig, you're saying so be the word or truth of God. Amen. So be it. So that's a good thing. Amen. Verse 15 of Daniel 7. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and visions of my head troubled me. Verse 16. I came near to the one of those who stood by, and I asked him the truth about all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Verse 17, those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. Verse 18, but the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. How many like that? Possess the kingdom forever and ever. In chapter 2 here, or in chapter 2, I'm sorry, we see Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Remember, he had that dream of a huge image. He saw this huge image. And remember, the head was gold, the chest was silver and arms of silver, the belly of brass, and then legs of iron, and then feet, ten toes of iron and, bra- and, and clay. And we see that image of a man with a head of gold, as I said, chest of silver and belly of brass, legs of iron. Hear this. From man's perspective... World history and its governments would seem to be stately, valuable, and very impressive. But hear this. In chapter 7, we see from God's perspective that those empires or governments are not silver. They're not brass or gold or you know whatever. They're not all this, but they are considered by God beastly. And what is a beast? It's ferocious. It's vicious. It attacks things. It, you know, how, many know, how many know a lion is not a nice animal if you're a, a, a leopard or a cheetah? Right? Or not cheetah. What do you call it? Uh, what's a little gazelle? Right? How many know it's not nice? <laughs> like a little kid. You know, that thing. You know, but how many know it's not? And that's what God compares the government. So hear this, guys. If you're hoping for a candidate to save the world, how many know you're dreaming. Now, hear me. I think we should vote for the lesser of evils. Amen? You know, I used to tell people, I was talking to a Mormon yesterday, and we were talking about uh, Mitt Romney, and I remember Christians would say, I can't vote for a Mormon. And yet, I remember this one pastor said, well, they say it's a lesser of two evils. I said, hey, this one pastor said, if, you, if Jesus isn't on the ballot, you're always voting for the lesser of two evils. Yeah, you know, as long as, amen, <laughs> you can clap your hand that. But God is good. And you have to realize this, is that I believe we should vote for the best candidate. But hear this, there is some truth when it says, when someone said absolute power corrupts absolutely. If you've ever had a position of power, it's real easy to forget where you come from and forget to think, hey, I'm invincible. I am somebody. I am great. Isn't that what Nebuchadnezzar did? He said, look what I've done. Remember, the eighth wonder of the world. The, the, he built this thing. It's where Babel came from. He had these 320-foot-high walls, 80 feet thick, could raise six chariots around it, hanging gardens were the eighth wonder of the world. And he just goes, look, I am God. And what happened? God humbled him. How many know that can happen to America? It can happen to anyone who believes that they can do this without God. And I want to tell you, <laughs> I said this, and I'll say it again last week. I was hurt. This is one of the things in the news I didn't like, but I read it. The Bible is now in the top 10 list of most feared books in our libraries and public schools. How many know if you were God, would anyone be hurt by that? The Bible, which our government was founded on, our, our laws were founded on, is now more fearful to, to most Americans than even the Koran. How many know that's scary? How many know we should be surrendering to God in worship? Because guess what your surrender is saying? Lord, even though a lot of people might be rejecting you, we surrender. And guess what? God hears the cry of the remnant. Amen? He doesn't say, if my liberals, if the liberal people of America will turn, he says, if my people will turn from their wicked ways and humble themselves and pray, then I will what? Forgive their sin and I will what? Heal their land. 
but me, we. So when you're sitting there going, Holy Spirit, come. I guess have your way. Guess what? You should be crying out. Amen. If you knew your surrender meant the revival or awakening of America back to God, how many of you would be like, Holy Spirit, come. Woo! You know, I mean, you would be excited. Because you'd say, I need a move of God. And I want the Bible to be valued again. I don't want to be, you know, it's like Kevin said. You know, they say that 80% of America claims to be Christian. But yet it's not proper to be a Christian. You know what it means? Hear this. Let me reword it for you. 80% of America wants to be saved, but they don't want to live for God. Is that not the point? People say, oh, I want, oh yeah, Jesus, woo! But live for Jesus? No. We want to live our way. But guess what? You can't love God and live for God and not live for God. Amen. You can't have salvation. Jesus said, if you, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do what I say? If you love Jesus, you will live for Jesus. It doesn't mean you will be perfect, but your heart will be to live for him. Amen? Amen. And so we want that. Amen? Verse 19. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast. This is the last one. Which was different from all the others. Exceedingly dreadful. Full. Exceedingly dreadful. So scary. That's why he's troubled. With its teeth of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured and broke into pieces and trampled the residue with its feet. So this beast is beastly. Verse 20. And then the ten horns that were on its head and, the, and another horn which came up before which the, the uh, three fell. Namely that, hor- or namely, that horn which the eyes and mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. Verse 21, I was watching, and the same hor- uh, horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. Verse 22, until the Ancient of Days, that's Jesus, came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. I like that. Perhaps it's because the only one described as exceedingly dreadful, Daniel asked for more information concerning this dreadful beast. What is this? What, what is this dreadful beast that's going to, for a time, prevail against the saints? I don't know about you, but I'd like to know what that is. And so he's saying, what is that? Verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all the other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. Verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings, or that ten Roman federation, who shall rise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings, three kingdoms. The fourth kingdom, as I said, is the Roman or revived Roman Empire in which this little horn or the Antichrist is going to come out of. So when people used to say, someone used to say, people would say, oh, you know, our president is the Antichrist. No, the Antichrist is going to come out of the Roman Empire, amen? So we need to know, do we look towards Europe for the Antichrist? It's not going to be here. He might travel here, but he's not going to be from here. Verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it amazing that Satan... Worship God. Satan was his worship leader. Satan has seen the glory of God, yet he speaks pompous words against God. Isn't that that just amazing? Just like a spoiled little kid. Isn't it amazing? And that he he still thinks he's going to beat God, yet he has to ask God for permission to do anything. He has to say, can I do this? Can I do this? Can I I mess with Job? And yet he somehow thinks he's going to break the leash someday. It's just amazing to me. But he says, he speaks pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times, hear that, and law or laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. How many know that's Old English? What does that mean? You know, times, times, time, or time, times, and half a time. Let's look at a couple aspects from this verse, verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Antichrist 
will be, he, you know, how many know I said last week, he's not going to come going, <laughs> he's not going to come with a cape and a tail and a curled mustache, you know, like, does anyone, what was that, Bullwinkle, what was it, the guy, Smedley, you know, had the, he's not going to come like, he's not going to come like a villain. He's going to come like a great orator. He's going to come like this great leader that has the answers. And how many know the way our world's getting How many know you see the stage being set for a one world leader to say, here I come to save the day, right? And then people are going to go, yes. Because why? Because a lot of people are not looking to God anymore. They're looking to men. How many know that, remember when men falls, what it says in Romans 1, they worship the creation rather than what? The creator. And so we, we tend to go, hey, I like myself, so I'll worship another man or another woman. I'll worship someone but God. How many know the only hope for this world, and especially America, is God? Amen. Only hope. So he's going to be this captivated uh, speaker. He's going to just grab people. He's going to be like, like a powerful Hitler. Now, isn't that funny? Did you ever see Hitler? I, I don't understand how he's... He, they say he was one of the most captivating speakers. You ever hear, I mean, I don't go, yes. Oh, did you hear? I didn't... Grab that, you know. Now, if someone speaks, you know, someone speaks Italian, ugh, you know, that's cool because it's, it's a romantic language. But how many know, I'm German, so I can dog it. You know, Fräulein, you look hot. No, it doesn't, that doesn't sound good. But he's going to be able to captivate people. But how many know this? Just like there's a, a godly anointing that I someday hope to have. Okay. But just like there's an anointing or blessing, how many know there's a satanic Satanic, satanic blessing and anointing on these speakers. And, and where he'll just captivate people. And you saw that if you saw the Left Behind series, the movie, you saw where the guy, the Antichrist, shoots the guy and everyone didn't see it. And he goes, you saw that? And everyone's like, no, I didn't see it. And I don't know about you, but there's been certain political people, and I better be good here, but they speak and people say, oh, it's the best speaker I've ever heard in my life. And I'm like, no. Nah. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? No. Nah. Not really. Not hearing it. But how I know, if you're given to the flesh, the devil will be able to anoint that speaker to where he'll speak things to you that you'll go, ha. Huh. But hopefully you and I, right, if that person, I don't believe we're going to be here, but if someone who's satanically inspired speaks, we go, eh. It's like a fingernails. <laughs> oh, no. Right? Just like someone jumped. Yeah. It's going to be like that. But if you're in the flesh, you're going to go, I love it. Second thing, he shall persecute the saints of the Most High, verse 25. Who are the saints? Well, hear this. Some of you are going, oh, no, we're going to be here? No. No, it's not us. It's the tribulational saints. It's those who get saved. These are the saints in Revelation 12. These are the saints who get saved in the, the Jewish people. Remember, the Jewish people are going to go, they're going to see, they're going to go, they're going to realize that Jesus is their Messiah. So many Jews are going to come to know the Lord during the tribulation period. It's going to be a great terrible time where God pours out his wrath upon an unbelieving world. He's, and so hear this. People say, well, how come you don't think we're not going to be there? Because God says what? First Thessalonians would be 5, 3, I think. He says that God has not predestined us to wrath. Amen? Amen? So this is not the wrath of just the devil like now. This is now the wrath of the devil and the wrath of God. This is God pouring out his, you can read that at the end of Revelation 6, where he pours out his wrath against a Christ-rejecting world. So these are the people who get saved during the tribulation. We're already raptured out of here. How many are excited about that? Yay. If you're not saved, then get saved today so you can be part of that. But there, we, these are the tribulational saints who get, who get saved. Revelation 12 says this. We see who the Antichrist is against. Here it is. You don't have to turn there. Just write it down. You can check it later. Revelation 12, 13 through 14. It describes the same. How many know Daniel and Revelation are connected? They're connected. And you can't really understand Revelation without understanding Daniel. You can't understand Daniel without understanding Revelation. They work together. And so here it is. And when the dragon saw that he was cast onto the earth. He persecuted the woman. And for the sake, I don't want to go into this because I will preach for an hour and a half. So I'm only going to go for an hour and 20 minutes this time. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, this is Israel. You know, if you want to argue with me about it, you can afterwards. But this is Israel. And he says that persecuted the woman, Israel, which brought forth a man child, talking about Jesus came through Israel. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness in her place where she is to be nourished 
uh, for a time and times and half a time. You hear that again? Times, time, and half a time. So here's how it connects. So what is a time, times, and half a time? Time speaks of one year. Time speaks of two years. And a half a time speaks of a half year. So that's three and a half years. Amen? How long is the tribulation period? Seven years. So what's half of seven? Three and a half. So the first three and a half years of the tribulation will be God pouring on his wrath still, but the Antichrist will look good. He'll be the, 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 the savior of the day, and he'll be the one calling everyone together and peace, and he'll bring Israel. Some people say, I've told you, scholars believe that you, there's a dome of the rock that you see next to the dome. If you're looking for the Mount of Olives, you see the dome of the rock, but right to the right of it is this little called the Dome of the Spirits. And uh, I can show you a picture of it. But the Dome of the Spirits, but they believe that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. So really, it says in Isaiah, mark off the court of the Gentiles. And so that's what the Dome of the Rock is. But some people believe the Antichrist will allow the Jews to have a temple right next to the Dome of the Rock. How many know that would be an amazing thing? Amazing. And you think, oh, peace, this guy's so great. And all the Jews are going to go, oh, but then after three and a half years, he's going to say, <laughs> he's going to go, <laughs> he's going to say, guess what? I'm not who you think I am. He'll set himself, he'll stand in the temple and say, now worship me. I am your God. And the Jews will go, you know, whoa, and they'll flee. And that's where they run. But that's how we, how we know the tribulation, the first half, first three and a half years is the tribulation period. The second half is the great Tribulation, because Satan's going to just come out, and he's going to say, hey, <laughs> you guys are a bunch of fools. This is who I am, and he'll come with great fury to those that will not worship him and take his mark. At the midpoint of seven-year tribulation, Antichrist will suddenly wage war against the Jews and against those who will not receive his mark, against even Gentiles who accept Christ. When he first comes on the scene, he will win the approval of the entire world. But as I said, after three and a half years, he'll show his true colors when he sets up an image of himself in the temple. That's the abomination of desolation where he'll just, he'll just defile the temple. And he demands to be worshiped as God. God, however, will protect Israel, the woman, by taking her, and a lot of scholars believe this. This isn't thus saith the Lord, but a lot of scholars believe this. He'll take them to the place, the wilderness, most likely scholars believe, the rock-walled city of Petra. Have you ever heard of Petra? It's a big walled city. People believe this so much, they're even putting Bibles in there and New Testaments and books on how to get saved because they believe that's where God will lead them to protect them in that, that walled city of Petra in Jordan to protect them. Revelation 13, 7 says this, And it was given unto him, that's the Antichrist, to make war with the saints, tribulational saints, and overcome them. And power was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. We, the church, as I said, are already raptured out of here. Aren't we glad for that? Woo! Right? We're out of here. And the people of Israel, as, we, as well as the Gentile, the tribulation saints, who get saved during the tribulation period, but it's going to hear this. Those that get saved, I've heard people say this, and sadly, in this church, and Hopefully you're still not, people aren't here that believe that. But they'll say, hey, you know what? I'm going to get saved in the tribulation. How many know that if you get saved in the tribulation, you're probably going to have to die for Christ? People say, oh, I don't care. I'll do it. Oh. I love what one person said this. If you can't live for Christ in a life situation now when it's fairly good, how can you live for God in the death situation? When you can't buy and you can't sell without the mark of the beast. And you take the mark, you can't eat, drink, you can't do anything. How many of you are going towards a cashless society? There was someone I saw on Fox News, there was someone saying, how many would like to have a cashless society? And people were signing the petition like crazy. We're moving towards that. You know that, right? I mean, if it wasn't for the mark part, I would think it was great, wouldn't you? I mean, cash society, just have a little, I would think it's great. But how many know that mark isn't just going to be buying and selling? That mark is going to be also a mark that your allegiance to the beast. That's scary, isn't it? Very scary. But hear this. Don't lose your head. Be smart. Get saved now. If you're not saved, then get saved today. Go to someone and get saved. Say, Jesus, it's just simple. Here, here's my prayer, how I came to the Lord. Lord, I hate my life. <laughs> I ruined it. But now my life is yours. Please save me. I surrender to you. And I got saved. 
How many know that's all you have to do? Is just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I, I, Jesus, take the wheel. That's all you have to do. Just take it. I'm done with it. You know what I mean? And that's all you have to say. It's not a big deal. It's not a special. Thus thou us, O goddess. No. You just say, Lord, I love you. And I'm tired of running my life. Amen? Amen. The third thing is in verse 25. And shall intend, this is interesting, to change the times and law or laws. Isn't that cool? Isn't that weird? I mean, times and laws, what does that mean? Perhaps it means that he's going to try to change the calendar. He's going to try to change the calendar to forget God. You say, what? Do you know this? I love studying the Bible. I love studying history. I didn't like it when I was in high school and college, but I love it now. I wish I, wish I was a smarter man. You know, but when I could have learned it, I was doing things I shouldn't do. But anyways... In 1972, or 1792, sorry, 1792, during the French Revolution, there was an attempt made to do away with the seven-day work week. Did you know that? I talked to one person, I said, yeah, I knew that. Seven-day work week, they wanted to get rid of Sunday. Because they were saying, you know what, they said, you know, if you persecute the king, you're persecuting God, so death to the person who speaks against the king. So they kind of were angry with God, but they wanted to get away, get from a seven-day work week and get rid of Sunday. And guess what they wanted to go to? A 10-day work week. <sighs> Can you imagine? I mean, you know, that, a 10-day, now I would be cool with a four-day work week, Right? In a four-day vacation uh, weekend, but I mean, how do we know this? I won't tell you this. I won't say this, <clears throat> Hillary Clinton. But um, uh, there's a politician. Do you know that that wants us to have a six-day school week? How many kids can say no way? <laughs> six-day school week. You'll never see your kids. That's one of our candidates wants a six-day school week. I want to say, hey, if you don't like your kid, cool. But I like my kids. I want to see my kids. How many know we don't see our kids enough? Six-day school week? I mean, come on, no way. I like Phoenix. Someone, Rachel was telling me, in Phoenix, they have a four-day school week. Wow. I always love it when people say, would you rather work eight hours, a, a, a five-day, eight-hour week, or a, a four twelves? Four twelves, baby. Three-day week, weekend, amen? And I mean, I like that. But anyway, so you guys, wait, sorry. Did I say the candidate's name? Is that what you're mad at? He's naughty, naughty. I am, yeah, I'm naughty. Isn't it weird we have, isn't it crazy? Can I just say this? I'm going to speak. Yes. I have the mic. I think it's crazy how we have the First Amendment to say anything, but somehow President Johnson was able to sneak through that a pastor can't say anything anymore. I don't have a problem with that. We should be able to say anything. I mean, anyone else, all the weirdos say anything, but I can't say that who I think is the best candidate. How many, just because I say someone's a good candidate doesn't mean you have to vote for them, does it? You have a brain. But I can't say that now because, well, yank, your 5013C status, you know? But, you know, I just, it's crazy. I mean, I just don't understand how we let, it happened late at night, he slipped it through. But I mean, no, that's, that's against the First Amendment. It's crazy. Do you realize it was the pastors that inspired people like, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, the British are coming. Uh, Paul Revere. As soon as Paul Revere was going to be killed, they said, oh, we're going to kill Paul Revere. He ran into a church. He said the five most inspiring men to him, three of, two of them, I think two or three, I think it was two for sure, that were pastors. How do we know we need pastors to be men of God again? We need pastors to speak the truth and are willing to put their line. And I love this. Paul Revere goes, hey, just pray for us. We're probably going to be killed. And you know what happened? There was 100 men there. The church said, no, we're going to die with you. And they said, we're getting about 250 by lunch, so don't worry about it. We're, we got your back. How we know today? Amen. Bummer, dude. Later, you know. What I mean, it's like we'll pray for you. God bless you. Love, you know, he's over there. You know, I mean, we would just, you know, how many know we need some grit again? Yes. We need some loving grit that says, "Hey, no, we're not going to be this way." You know what I mean? I, anyway, yeah, I get a little worked up. Anyway, where am I? The possibly also that he knows. Hear this. This is the other thing where he says he's going to change the times, but he also says he's going to change the law. That he knows the prophecies about Daniel, the Daniel's prophecies in Revelation, but he thinks he can beat the rap. He thinks he can beat God. How I many know that's he's an insane genius? He's smart, but he's also crazy because he thinks he can beat God. Yet God says, "No, don't do that." Okay, you know, I mean, how's he think? But one day he's going to go, "No," and he thinks he's going to break the chain, but he can't. He thinks he can be victorious in the end. But hear this: I like this. One commentator said this. Has anyone worked with youth, ever been around kids? 
and you're around the pool, right? And all of a sudden, as a youth pastor, I was a youth pastor for many years, and all of a sudden, you see a bunch of kids in the corner talking, and, like, and all of a sudden, you know they're going to try to push you in the pool. Well, I used to wrestle, and I'm kind of a big lug, and so my thing was, push me in the pool, but guess what? You're all coming with me. And that's kind of what I think Satan does. You know, he's like, hey, I'm already going to hell, so I might as well try to grab as many people with me as possible. And how many know, that's why he's fierce, that's why he's dangerous, and that's why we should want nothing to do with him. Because he, is, he knows, what is this, the old worldly saying? Misery loves company. I don't know about you, I don't like misery, so I don't want to be in his company of misery, amen? So we should flee him and get away from him as best as possible in the name of Jesus. Lastly, he says, the saints shall be given into his hand. This is the Antichrist for a time, times, and half a time. But hear this, only for three and a half years. Now, it's going to seem like a long three and a half years, amen? That's why I say get saved today. If you're not saved, if you're not sure you're saved, then give your heart to Jesus so that you will be... Calgon, take me away, amen, out of here, so you don't have to go through it, because I'll tell you this, you know, I, uh, a police officer in our church, right, this is about 14 years ago, but he was trying to show me how bad Al-Qaeda was, and he showed me a video of a beheading, and I will tell you that I wish I hadn't watched it, but that was, this. it wasn't the video, because, you know, I used to watch bad movies before Christ, and I've seen a lot of, you know, horror movies, but what got me was the sound. And it literally changed my life. I mean, to where I have to really pray to love radical Al-Qaeda people because we're living in brutal, brutal times. And it's only going to get worse, amen, before it gets better. And so that's why we need to live for God and we need to be on a mission to get as many. I love what one pastor said. This world is like a sinking ship and we're to try to rescue as many people before it goes down. Amen? Amen? So we need to be sharing Christ, telling people. If someone says, I'm not sure if I'm saved, well, make sure! <laughs> you know, because you don't want your loved one or even your enemy to go through the great tribulation period. Verse 26, But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion. Amen. Consume and destroy it forever. I like that, forever. Verse 27, The kingdom... The kingdom and dominion and greatness of the, the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dom all dominions shall serve and obey him. I love that. This world leader, this little horn, this big time power, this Antichrist is going to go down. I'm excited about that. He's going to go down once and for all. Amen. Give the Lord a clap. Amen. And all dominions shall serve Jesus. Amen. Everyone shall serve Jesus. So realize he is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. How many knows? Jesus allows you a choice to bow now, but how many know one day every knee will bow, whether they, the, the worst Satanist, the worst Al-Qaeda, whatever, is going to bow to the authority of Jesus. He is going to come back. He came as a humble shepherd, but he's going to come back as conquering king with a rod of iron. Amen. How many excited about that? I can't wait till Jesus takes back the world that is right his. Oh, when the man, I, I want to tell you this, when will man understand this? When will man understand that Jesus is the answer to the world's woes? When will the church understand that it isn't a program, that it isn't being cool lights, it isn't all this stuff, but it's Jesus is the answer? Yes. And I want to tell you this, inscribed in the United Nations, the building in New York, it says this verse, it says half a verse. How many know that's not good when you do half a verse sometimes? Half a verse, and they leave out the most important part, and here it is, half of the verse, Isaiah 2, 4. It says, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, they, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. How many of that's good? I like that's great that they have a verse on it. I love it. They probably wouldn't do it today, but they have that verse on it. I don't know if they've taken it off, but they do. They had that verse. They had that verse. But here's the problem. They left out why that verse will be true. They left out the beginning of that verse. And here it is. Here's the beginning. See if you see the importance of it. It says in Isaiah 2, 4, The Lord 
Jesus. He didn't say Jesus, but that's who he's talking about. The Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. Amen? Amen. And how many know we're going to be a part of that? We're going to come back in the second coming of Christ. We've been raptured. We have a seven-year honeymoon. We'll get to eat. And, and I tell you, this fried chicken in, in heaven is going to be tofu. It's going to be healthy. Good food is going to be good for you. And healthy food is going to be bad. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of you healthy people, that's just wrong. <laughs> that's what well, heaven will be for me. <laughs> so, but, but we're going to have, don't you love that we're going to have eating in heaven? Isn't that cool? That's our gift, isn't it? As Christians, what do we do? We used to drink, we used to party. Now what do we do? We eat. Let's go eat, you know? I mean, I love it. It's so much better, right? There's no hangover. I mean, you might feel a little bloated the next day, but it's good, you know? Get on the treadmill, waddle on it. It's good, you know? But anyway, come back, Holy Spirit, right? But they left out Jesus. It's the Lord is the one who will bring peace to the world. It's the Lord who will... Mediate disputes. And how many of we're going to be a part of that? We're going to come with them on white horses. Some of you girls go, oh, I love it, horses. We're going to just be riding horses, you know, whoosh, whoosh, you know, woo, right? High ho silver. And we're going to reign. And then we're going to rule and reign this earth. Because guess what? The tribulational saints, those who get saved in the tribulation, the Jews and the Gentiles, they're going to still be on the earth. They're going to be like us. They're going to have a sinful nature still. And we are going to govern the earth with Jesus to see that Christ's will is done for a thousand years. And then forever and ever, but Amen. for a thousand years. I'm excited about that. Yeah. I told you, hey, guys, I've already got dibs on Maui. <laughs> but you guys can visit anytime you want. It's going to be good. We're going to have, it's going to be peaceful and beautiful. It's already beautiful, but yeah. peace now is going to be great. You know, no, <laughs> no, no, I won't say anything. But it's going to be great. I've got it all worked out. It's good. <laughs> but anyway, Jesus is going to do that. And we're going to be a part of that to see him make a good government. But hear this, man's attempt to make good governments is beastly at best. Amen? It's amazing all the crazy things government people say. Do you remember, do you remember what President uh, Obama said? He said, if I spend half as much as Bush in my first term, do not vote for me a second term. Yet he spent more than all of our presidents combined. <laughs> you know, but we can't say that, can we? But how many know? Isn't that a pretty big lie? But he'll say, Bush, oh, Bush, 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 Bush. I love one person said, eight years? And really? You couldn't do a thing? No, nope, Bush. you think Bush is the Antichrist, wouldn't you? How many know Bush isn't perfect, but he is a believer? Amen? You know, I, I love it when you hear Christians. I don't love it. I'm saying it facetiously. When you hear Christians shred Bush. I remember my grandma, she's a Christian, but she said, that bushy baby, bushy baby. It wasn't good bushy, like bushy, cutesy baby. It was bad. But how many know, he's a believer. And we, how many know the Bible says this? We should be kind to all, especially those in the household of God. And sometimes we treat the world better than we treat Christians. That's weird. Amen? That's weird. I mean, I, I'm about being fair, but how many know, we should be kind to our brothers and sisters. Because how many know, we need it out there. Amen? We need our brothers to love each other because that's why we come to church because we want to know that people love us. We want to know that other people love God and that we're not alone. Amen. That's why I think it's so important that the Bible says in the last days, don't forsake fellowshipping with other believers, which is the custom of some. In the last days, you'll want to stay home. Why? Because Al-Qaeda could come. Because it's just scary. But how many know you need to be here to be built up, to be encouraged, to see that there's other people that love Jesus too. Amen? It is encouraging. When you see other people raise their hands, you go, I mean, I'm not the only weirdo that raises their hands. That's good. Woo. You know, I always say it's like satellite. Ooh, do, do, do. I mean, hey, you know, lift your I always love this. People go, I can't lift my hands. They say, it's no big deal. It's a personal worship. Lifting your hands doesn't mean anything. Then why is it such a big deal to you? Ah, because it's surrender. How many know if someone went, chur, chur, stick them up? You wouldn't go, personal. Sorry, I can't do it. <laughs> you would be right. Ra- yeah! Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Right? But God says, hey, would you just surrender? That's all it is. That's what we're doing, surrendering. It's just saying, God, I love you. Amen. It's not saying you're getting special. Sa- oh, over here. God's right here, right here, right there. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying, I love God. I surrender. Amen? Amen. And we should do that. Amen. We should all have the little rabbit ears up. Remember the old, remember the old antennas? We should all try to, there we go. Right? <laughs> Put the little tinfoil on it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. Oh. 
I'm just worked up today. I, don't know what's up. I drink a lot of iced tea. That's what it is, I think. But anyways. But hear this. Here's what God sees a beast. He sees it this way. Beasts get angry easily, right? You come by a bear. I mean, they don't go, hi. You don't hear purring bears, right? They get angry. They guard their territory fiercely. And they even like to expand their territory. They want to keep moving it out. They don't go, well, I give you rabbits needed territory. No, they just want to keep moving out. They also guard their territory ferociously, right? Just walk, you know, we used to, my aunt was like a major tree hugger from Oregon. And we used to go to, uh, I forget, it was Kodiak country. I don't know where it was in Alaska. But we'd see these really thick trails and above this beautiful lake. And these trails, it was grass, and these trails would be like this deep. And I go, man, these are beautiful trails. What are they? And the park ranger goes, these are Kodiak trails. Kodiak bear, biggest bear. And he goes, this is where they walk. And they walk around here like twice a day. And if you get in their way, they'll kill you. Because that's their territory. And they'll be like, wrong path. Right? And I'm going, and we're hiking on this path. I'm going, I'm not the smartest tool, kid in the shed, but I'm a tool in the shed. But I'm going, I don't think we should be on their trail. My, my aunt goes, we got bells on our feet. It'll scare them away. Um... <laughs> No, I think it's more of a dinner bell. Ding, 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 I'm over here. You know? Golly. But anyways, you know. <laughs> dinner time! You know, but no, it's just good. But, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they shed blood easily. You know, you never see a bear. You don't see the bears, the blood all. You don't see them going, oh, I'm sorry. They just, they callously shed blood. You never see a bear marching to save the rabbits. Never, right? You know, these poor rabbits, they're so cute. And we just, no, we can't do it, right? What beasts want, what they want, they go after. They take whatever they can get, and they expand their territory whenever possible, and that's what God sees man's government as. Amen? And you just need to know that. So when you go, our government is so corrupt, oh my goodness. Amen. God says it. Amen. He says that. So when you go, it just, I don't think it's going to get fixed. It isn't. Now, that doesn't mean you go, you don't vote and you don't do your best to try to vote in godly officials, but you just know when you vote for a godly official and things don't work out the way you hoped, don't freak out because God said 2,700 years ago or more that that's the way it's going to happen. Amen. So you have peace because you know the end, right? You know what's coming. You know, ooh, not good, but it's going to be good. Amen. Hear this, guys. It's why God, God, it's not about a person. Or I'm sorry, it's not about a program, but it's about a person. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. It's about the Prince of Peace who will bring peace to this world. Amen. And that's why we should just love him, and that's why we should just surrender to him, and that's why we should serve him. And hear this, guys. I, you know, I want this church to grow. I do. But hear this, I don't want it to grow just behind in the seat. I want this to grow the way Jesus said. If you see on our logo, if you see on our front, it says making disciples. How many of you know Jesus didn't say, just get a bunch of people to come in and be carnal for me? He said what? Go to the highways and byways and make what? Disciples. You know what the word disciple means? It means a disciplined follower of God. Someone who follows God with all their heart and lives. How many of you know salvation is instant? But how many know if you really are saved and you really thank God for that, you will now say, I want to give you my life. You'll say, I will show you my faith in Christ by my what? Good works. My good works don't save me, but my good works are the proof of my love that God is real in my life. Amen? And that's what we want. That's what I want from you guys. I, I, I'm tired of having families. They say statistically that we're just like the world. How many would like to see that change? I'd like to see divorce go down in this church. i like to see, uh, you know, Child abuse go down. Like every, they say everything is like the world in the church. How many think that's wrong? And that should change. But that can only change, not with going to a worldly counselor, that changes with going to Jesus Amen. and surrendering your life to him. Man does not have the ability to rule himself well. Why? Because he's sinful and corrupt beast without God. How many know that? How many can admit I was a beast? You know, I wake up in the morning now still. It takes a little while to go, Holy Spirit, please fill me, right? I don't wake up happy. Anyone else out there like that? I wake up, mm, you know? I'm happy at night, but not in the morning, right? But how many know that's because without God, we're that way? How many know this? I always love this. Hear this. This is free. 
I always love what one Ravi Zacharias said. This. You always want to see where someone is spiritually. See if they're religious or they really have a relationship with God. He says, ask them this question. Do you believe man is basically good? And he said, the people said, oh, yes, we're precious. Then you know, mm, religious. But he says, if you, you ask someone, what do you think of man? Oh, we are beasts. We're, even, we're mean. We're naughty. We need a savior. Then you go, ah, I think that only person knows Jesus. Amen? Amen. Because that's why you became a Christian. Because you knew, I'm naughty without Jesus. I'm mean. I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good dad. I'm not a good anything. I need a savior. Amen. And think about it. If you're here to go, I'm really awesome. Then why do you need a savior? You know? And trust us. If you ask us, we can find something bad about you. <laughs> That's a church's gift, right? No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. No, forget it. Anyway. But hear this. On the other hand, the Ancient of Days, Jesus can change. He can, he, he can change this world. And his kingdom is right. It's beautiful. In his kingdom, there will be truth and justice always. I long for that. I can't, I, mean, I can't wait for that. It's going to be so cool when Jesus rules and reigns this earth. Verse 28, and we're done. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, because he saw all that was going to happen for a while, and my countenance changed. But, and here's the but, I love this, but I kept the matter in my heart. Amen? Daniel saw world history from God's perspective. Daniel was troubled because he saw the ravaging of the Antichrist in the world. But he kept the matter in his heart. How many know that you and I need to do that too? How many want to be like Daniel? I want to be a godly man. Godly woman, if you're a woman, right? But he kept, Daniel kept in his heart that the kingdom of God is coming soon. Hear this, guys. This world is going crazy. Amen? It's spinning out of control. But the only hope, the only way you can hold on to hope and be strong in these last days is to know that God is coming back soon. Amen. That we're either going to be raptured, or he's coming, you know, but we're going to be raptured out of this. How many know that is the answer? Because if you don't know that, then you are going to freak out, you're going to hide out, and you're going to just be like, God, what are you doing? But if you know that God's coming back, you'll be able to endure how many know this? I was reading today about the Church of Philadelphia, and one of the things it says about it, that he will save those who what? Who persevere to the end. He who endures to the end will be saved. How many know he wouldn't say you need to endure if it wouldn't be hard to endure? He's saying that, that there's going to be times you go, oh God, are you there? But we need to say, nope, I know he's here because he's told me it was going to be bad. He's told me it was going to get hard. And how I many, we're not going to see all this, but we're going to probably see some of this, the setup for it at least. Aren't we seeing it? Yes. And so we need to know that and go, oh, <laughs> but I kept it in my heart. Even though I've seen the trouble in the Bible, I kept it in my heart that God's coming back right. and going to make things right. Amen? Amen. Amen? He's going to set up his kingdom. Would you turn with me to one last scripture? Turn with me here. I want you to see this because you should mark this scripture in your Bible. It's in Luke chapter 21. Verse 26, Luke 21, verse 26. And talking about the last days, Jesus is talking. He says this, people will be terrified at what they see coming upon the earth. How many know we're already there, right? They're going to be terrified at what's coming on the earth. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. All kinds of weird things are going to happen. Verse 27, then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the cloud and with a power and great glory. Hear this, this is for us. So when all these things begin to happen, all the craziness, stand up, look up for your redemption draws near. How many like that? Yes. Look up for your redemption draws near. You always hear that. I, was, I love one of my favorite movies is, uh, is uh, Glory Road. And the guys all have their head down. He goes, get your head up. Get your head up. How many know we need to do that? Yes. Get your head up, church. Not, cock, not in a cocky way, not in a, mm, but get your head up to say, I look, even though I see all the craziness, I worship the Lord. I look up because I know my redemption draws near. My Redeemer draws near. Amen? God. Amen? Yes. God's good. Let's give the Lord a clap when he's coming back. Yeah. Amen.
And like I said, if you don't know Jesus and you'd like to know Jesus, then come see me. You know, um, maybe I'll just pray a prayer. Can I just pray a prayer to receive Jesus? And you just pray this prayer after me in your heart. And I just want to make that, and then I'll close with prayer. Just pray this with me in your heart if this is you, if you need to receive Jesus or recommit your life. Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I give you my life for the first time, or I recommit my life to you. But I ask that you would fill me and you would empower me to live for you all the days of my life. Thank you for forgiving me and thank you for saving me. Let me be ready for the rapture, Lord. I don't want to miss out on that glorious meeting you in the clouds. So, Father, I give you my life and I want to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' mighty name. Now I want to pray for those, everyone else. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're such a good God. You don't sugarcoat it. You don't lie to us. You tell us that that those who want to live a godly life will suffer persecution. You tell us that living in this sinful world is going to be hard at times. But you tell us to persevere. You say to us, Galatians 6, 9, you say, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we shall reap we not grow weary in well-doing. Give us that strength, amen? Give us strength to not grow weary. Give us strength to come to the church and pray, to come and be around other brothers and sisters who encourage us, to pray without ceasing, to cry out to you and say, Lord, as we said last week, that the two prayers, either for reawakening and revival or return. Lord, either revive this country or return, Father. But we don't want it to stay the same. So God, come. Come, if you're gonna, if you're gonna just revive us, let there be a remnant of churches, a remnant of people that love you with all their heart. But Lord, we thank you that no matter what happens, you're gonna turn all things together for good, and you're gonna come back and rule the reign and rule and reign this earth with an iron rod, with love and justice and peace. And so, God, thank you for that. And Satan will be bound forever. And we're so excited about that day. So, Lord, let that hope be seared in love, seared into their, your people's brains and in our hearts. To whenever we get discouraged, whenever we see something in the news, whenever we see the Bible being pushed out of schools and, and, and even out of churches, that we will have encouragement that you're coming back soon to make everything right. Let us believe that. Let us not be cynical about that. And say, oh, yeah, people have been saying that for years. No. Look up if your redemption draws near. And Jesus, we don't know when you're going to come back, Lord, but we know today is sooner than yesterday. Amen. And so, Father, give us that hope. Bless your people. Let your people be. I love what one man of God said. The man or woman with the most hope is the most influential. So, God, even in these discouraging times, let us be Christians who are filled with the hope of salvation, the hope of your return, and the hope that you're going to come back and establish your kingdom. Amen. We should be the most joyful people there are. So, Lord, let it be so. In Jesus' mighty name. And every greed said, amen. Amen.